Welcome. My name is Dr. Katherine Antley, and today we're recording another episode in of uh, the science of effective prevention. And today it is my honor and pleasure to welcome a very special guest from Colorado, Don Reinfeldt. Don Reinfeldt is the executive director of Blue Rising Together, um, and she's going to be on our show. And this is an organization which has worked for many years on issues which make it difficult to grow up in Colorado. In the past, they've focused on gun violence, but more recently, they're focusing on the harms and educating and warning the public about the harms of high potency uh, THC cannabis marijuana. Before I give the platform to Dawn to tell us all the wonderful things she's been doing in Colorado, I want to do th two very pretty quick clips. One is Dr. Chris Rogers, who's a psychiatrist and medical director of a large psychiatric hospital, and the other is the Attorney General of Colorado. So we'll get both the medical perspective and the and the legal perspective, and then we'll hear Don's story. As has been discussed, the rise in teenage use of high THC concentration marijuana is a critical public health challenge. It demands action. And it's important what's being done today. It is a model for the nation. Just consider the latest report from the Colorado Department of Health, Public Health and Environment in their Healthy Kids Colorado survey. They surveyed the use of dowry, which has been discussed, a way of accessing high THC potency. It went from 4.3% of students in 2015 to over 20% in 2019. This is an alarming rise, and this hospital, 1317, represents an important and a critical response to this threat. The Substance Abuse Trend and Response Task Force, which I chair, and Matt Bach, who's with me today, head of our Office of Community Engagement, is the vice chair, has focused on this issue, with leadership from parents, from public health advocates, identifying this troubling trend. This legislation meets that trend and addresses the fact that our medical marijuana laws have enabled teen access to high potency marijuana. As we in Colorado work to address this public health challenge and refine the regulatory program for overseeing legal cannabis, we need to do so in a way that protects kids. I'm the medical director of child and adolescent services at the Medical Center of Aurora, the largest non-publicly owned psychiatric hospital in the state. Here I'm an inpatient psychiatrist with a front row seat to the emerging epidemic of cannabis abuse and addiction that threatens to swallow the lives of a whole generation of Coloradans. On our adult inpatient unit, it's hard to keep count of the number of psychotic and suicidal patients that are admitted with THC on board. And regardless of the data or clear evidence of how cannabis contributes to their illness, person after person refuses to accept that marijuana could be bad for them. How could it be? They have been taught to believe this is a harmless plant, a medicine that is good for anything from headaches to cancer to anxiety. It's natural, without side effects, without risk of addiction. This is the lie that is ruining the lives of far too many people in our state. The story on our adolescent unit is even more tragic, as we repeatedly treat kids too psychotic to know what's real, who they can trust, or where they are. The rates of adolescent psychosis have grown steadily since legalization, and in almost every single case, is linked to the use of high THC potency concentrates. Products known as dabs or wax or shatter that are made in the lab by distilling down the most psychoactive component of the marijuana plant and concentrating it into what is better described as a hard drug than the weed people voted for in Amendment 64. Kids as young as 11 or 12 are using blow torches and glass rigs to use to smoke these highly addictive and harmful chemicals sometimes every night just to go to sleep. We have very little research to try and understand what this does to the developing brain, but as any child psychiatrist who treats these kids can tell you, we don't need a randomized control trial to see how dangerous and often tragic the effects are. We do know there's a clear risk between developing depression or even committing suicide related to earlier age of first use, as well as the potency of products. This means a 12-year-old trying a marijuana concentrate is at far greater risk of developing a mood disorder or even eventually killing themselves than a 30-year-old experimenting with a joint of flour. Unfortunately, it's far too easy for these 12-year-olds to get access to these products, and not from the black market or a shady drug dealer. They're getting them from friends at school or older siblings, many of whom have medical marijuana cards themselves, 
and ready access to as much shattered dab or wax as they could ever want. It's time for this to change. House Bill 1317 will provide stronger safeguards to keeping cannabis products out of the hands of Colorado's kids. Having reasonable limits on daily purchases of these highly addictive substances makes good sense. Maintaining adequate guidelines for providers to uphold when recommending cannabis, especially to young, brain, or young kids, is a no-brainer. We need a more robust tracking mechanism to better understand who is using medical cannabis products, how much, and in what form. And Colorado should be leading the way in researching high-potency THC products. We certainly are leading the way in their sales. We have a long way to go to help the kids in my hospital, but House Bill 1317 is a great place to start. The whole country is watching Colorado as other states look to legalize cannabis. Let's lead the country into a sustainable and responsible future we can all be proud of. Thank you. So Don, my first question to you is, um, you know, how, how did you end up, that was the press conference um, last, last spring, I guess. How did this come about? How did you, how did you realize that there was a problem and how did it get your attention? Uh, thanks, Catherine. It's wonderful to be here today. Um, and it's so nice to hear the quotes from both Phil Weiser and Chris Rogers. Um, so basically, um, we started working on this in Colorado. I um, run an organization called Blue Rising. And we started, as you said earlier, working on gun violence prevention issues after the Sandy Hook shooting. And that's kind of where I learned a lot of organizing skills. And I also learned the power of parents um, wanting to make change out of things that they saw that was wrong and how really parents coming together is an unstoppable force. So we started organizing around high potency THC because as a parent myself, I have teenagers and I saw um, in my community how high potency THC was having dramatic impacts amongst teens and that the legislators at the Capitol, most of whom did not have teenagers, many either have no children or little children or much older children, really were totally disconnected from how the policies that they were passing at the legislature were um, impacting their local communities. So having worked in this space for a while, we just started reaching out to legislators, organizing and kind of saying this isn't what you think it is and your policies are actually having a really dramatic effect on teens so, so in yep so in vermont you know over and over and over again for the last you know seven years folks have told us this is going to be good because now the marijuana is going to be locked behind the store door the store front doors right and it's not going to get out and so what part of that didn't work out for you so our laws um, about medical marijuana have been very laxed in Colorado. It's extremely easy for an 18 to 20 year old to get a medical card. Um, that actually is changing now that the law we passed is um, just started to be effective in January. But basically an 18 year old living at home on, still on their parents' insurance, could easily get a med card with a five-minute doctor's appointment. Actually, they often don't even take five minutes and um, get a card that would then let you purchase whatever you wanted in a store. And there is really no regulatory guidelines or framework to put products on the market. So if a marijuana company creates something, they can just put it on the market. They don't have to prove it's safe. They don't have to prove it's effective for any medical treatment whatsoever. If they can make it, they can put it in on the market and they can also claim it's medicine. There's no regulatory framework that they have to prove this is good for this condition and why. And so what happened is kids were able to just purchase whatever they want. They were allowed to purchase up to 40 grams of concentrate per dispensary per day. So 40 grams is like 40 bags of high potency concentrate shatter. And they're usually in, in flavors like Girl Scout cookies, birthday cake, pineapple express, you name whatever flavor might appeal to youth, that's what the shatter and shatter is in. So um, kids were very easy, able to get it. It's inexpensive and um, they would just sell to each other or 
um, or it would be given to them. It's just incredibly easy for kids to get. And the schools, when we first started our effort and with our lobbyists, we started me reaching out to different groups. We met with the um, Association of School Board uh, Superintendents, excuse me, and they said to us, there will not be one school district in the entire state that does not support this because they were so overwhelmed with the problems of kids dabbing high potency THC and then all of the mental health effects that were coming from that, that honestly, um, there was so much support from organizations like in the education community and the medical community to join on to this very large effort that really kind of ran the political spectrum. Our organization, Blue Rising, has um, always been um, on the democratic side of things. And, you know, one of the things that I feel like is a democratic bedrock in our philosophies is following science. And, you know, Democrats believe in following the science on COVID, on vaccinations, on climate change. And the argument that we made was if you believe in following science, then you need to follow science. And that includes industries that you've gotten too cozy with. And that's what happened. We said, we need to follow the science on high potency THC, regardless of what this industry that's actually out to make profit from addiction, we need to follow the science and protect the public health. So that's what we work to do here in Colorado. So when we passed our bill in Vermont, we had a couple of, of mentions of psychosis. They limited the THC to 30 and 60, 30 for flour and 60 for concentrates. And um, you know, we have had um, folks, um, I think, who've been impacted, and so they know very well the, the impact of uh, who, who wrote that bill. Um, so I think that had some impact into, and, and, and we had firsthand testimony um, as well. Um, but now there's the feeling that the recreational shops, we're not talking about medical marijuana, our medical marijuana shops have no limit on THC at all. Right. But our and our 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 medical ones, um, theoretically, there's there's a lot more controls than what you're talking about in Colorado. But we're talking about you know it, in a very short period of time, a few months, we're going to open shops, recreational shops. The recreational shops will have um, high po if, if this bill passes that they're talking about in Vermont, they're going to have no limit to THC. So why are these shops? Why is the industry put all of their money, you know, hired all of the lobbyists in Montpelier to try to get those, those limits lifted? It's all about money, honestly. And it's disappointing as a lifelong Democrat to see Democrats being willing to side with industry and money over public health. And there really is research from around the world. The industry will say, oh, there's not enough research, blah, blah, blah. It's totally untrue. There is research from around the world that, that is calling out the alarms for the damage that high potency THC is having in our communities. And honestly, so often in states across the country, we've seen this so much over the last couple of years, the industry is the only one at the table. They, they, um, they have the most money and the legislators aren't doing their homework to understand that this is a profit driven enterprise and the sales tax that states hope to gain from these products is nothing in comparison to the devastation that they wreak upon the next generation of your children. And we have found in Colorado, we have a very high teen suicide rate. And for 15 to 19 year olds in Colorado, 34% of the teens in Colorado that die by suicide have marijuana in their system. Now we can't definitively say the high potency TH is definitely causing suicide, but there is a relationship there that many research papers have started to highlight. And that in Colorado, we are also researching. But this is, it's amazing to see an industry that can put whatever they want on the market without having to prove it's safe. So for example, you can't go into a liquor store and buy vodka soaked tampons. They don't sell them, they're dangerous. But you can go into a, a cannabis store 
and by high potency THC vaginal and anal suppositories. There has been no studies that show those suppositories don't cause cancer, that they could maybe don't cause infertility. Nobody knows, but they can be put on the market. They can be told that they're medicine and, and our legislators are just happily looking the other way, um, except in Colorado, we are starting to actually like um, pay more attention to this, but around the country and as I watch states legalize without a genuine regulatory framework to protect the public health, it's really um, appalling and it's also terrifying because I know what is in store for the families in these states that do not understand that it is not a joint from the 1970s anymore. These are hard drug concentrates that have dramatically changed in their THC potency. Whereas in the 70s, it might have been three or 2% THC. Many of these products now are 80, 85% THC, 90. And uh, they're just not the same thing anymore. They're not a plant. They are, are not an innocuous plant anymore. So the Department of Health had a Dr. Professor Jonathan Calkins come and talk to us a few years ago, and a number of the legislators came and attended that. And he, he, one of the more remarkable things that he said was he was talking about the increase in concentration of THC, and he said it's gone up 60 percent. And if you don't want to say 60 percent, it's easily gone up 40 percent. And if you say uh, if you take caffeine, like the ca cup of coffee that we drink in the morning, and we increase that potency of the caffeine by 40 to 60 percent, it's borderline lethal. And that's wow. not, you know, a point that people are really wrapping their heads around. And I've often thought, you know, what would happen if they passed around 100 percent, 90 percent THC in a blowtorch, you know, in, in these conference rooms where they're passing these laws? Like how many of those um, legislators would be cool with that or, you know, would survive it? Uh, yeah. And how many of them would want their 18 year olds to do it or, or 21 year olds? Okay. Uh, yeah. Or 21 year olds. I mean, I, th I feel like that is kind of the, the, the worst part of this whole issue is the lies that have been told to communities across the country and honestly across the world that, that this is medicine, that it's safe. And I'm not saying there isn't a portion of products and THC that might possibly be medicinal as far as the seizures, the CBD oil, the low potency products. I, I don't, you know, I don't have a dog in that fight, whether, whether those, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the things that are 15, over 15% THC, and especially the stuff in the upwards of 60, 80, those kind of products. Humanity has not seen those kind of products created to be consumed the way they are and flavored. And then you add on it this lie, very similar to the Purdue Pharma story that um, OxyContin was not addictive. It's a very similar lie now. They say it's not addictive, it's medicine, it's a plant, it's totally wonderful. And it really wasn't until you know the Colorado legislature, and honestly, we have a wonderful speaker of the house in Colorado, a Democrat from Denver, and he's a parent, and he really saw like, wait a minute, we need to protect the public health and we need to be um, focused on science. And he really kind of took this um, to heart and wanted to make a difference on this issue. And um, it was a lot of legislators who were really willing to go out on a limb because they had heard from their own constituents and the parents that we were able to mobilize that this is a real thing. This isn't um, reefer madness. This isn't you know craziness over not liking cannabis. This is high potency THC that is very different from what most people think they are voting on. We find that when, even with our own legislators, when we first started this effort, when we started showing them what was for sale in dispensaries and how much those products had changed over time, and then as soon as they saw the anal and vaginal suppositories, many of the legislators were like, whoa, wait a minute, this isn't what I thought it was. And we need some sort of regulatory framework 
that's in place to protect the public health. Right. And it's, yeah, it's just disappointing, especially when you see democratic states that, that have tried so hard to adhere themselves to science to just watch them kind of toss it aside uh, for, for money. And it's very sad. I mean, the, the science is kind of difficult to get your mind around, but there's a lot of research out there. And some of the Colorado psychiatrists have done really done a deep dive into it. And I want to go, I want to show, I want to sh share them my screen and show the warnings that you, that the you know Department of Health in Colorado is now recommending that um, you display. One of the aspects of the House Bill 1317 that we passed required the state of Colorado to give out um, kind of a resource guide with every purchase of concentrates to anyone who purchases concentrates. And there was a rulemaking session, this was actually with the Marijuana Enforcement Division to look at all the research and come up with what are those warnings and what should they be. So, um, so the first one that the state of Colorado, now this has the seal of the state of Colorado on it. See if I can find it down here. Uh, there it is, right? Yeah. Uh, Colorado Gov. Yes, it's actually Colorado on the Department first page. of Public Health. If you scroll up to the first page, uh, uh, right there, Colorado Department, Department of, Revenue, of Marijuana Enforcement Division. And if you wouldn't mind going back down to scroll down to the warnings, so we could go over those. So the first warning is psychosis, which is psychotic. Um, psychotic symptoms, both de delusions and hallucinations, visual and auditory. Then it's also mental health problems or symptoms. It's very tied to depression and anxiety. Cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, which is uncontrolled and repetitive vomiting. In fact, youth call it greening out. And then cannabis use disorder, dependence, including physical and psychological dependence. High potency THC is addictive. It is not what it was in the 70s when it was not addictive, below 5%. Now concentrates are addictive and the state of Colorado is saying that. And if you scroll down just a teeny bit, a little bit um, right there, um, the state is also warning that um, there is moderate evidence and they define moderate as substantial earlier in the document that individuals who use marijuana with THC concentration greater than 10% are more likely than non-users to be diagnosed with psychotic disorder such as schizophrenia. And we have parents in our group whose kids have um, medically been diagnosed with cannabis-induced schizophrenia, and it is extremely hard to treat. There is very few medications that work on it, and it's very different from um, genetic schizophrenia, which we actually have quite a few medications that work on. Right. I remember talking to uh, Sir Robin Murray many, many years ago, I think 2013, and he was working, he and, and um, uh, Dr. DeForti were working on a study, and he, he said, I was preparing for a testimony, and he said, you can say we're gonna we're getting ready to publish. There are people who are psychotic and schizophrenic who would would be well, yes. but for their marijuana use. And I, that slayed me. It was such yeah. a devastating disease and disorder, not only for the individual but the entire sort of surrounding community that has to take you know the the that has to take care of the this person. It's very very expensive. Yeah, so yeah. you you're saying it's it's addictive, and we have here is Vermont the the um what we're um, what the cannabis control board is suggesting that they put on the on the uh, labels and they're saying it may be habit forming and you know walking my dog is habit forming you know working in my <laughs> um you know spending time with my husband is habit forming you know uh, having a nice conversation with you could be habit forming um so we we really take issue with with that terminology um, and they don't mention psychosis, even though the law, actually the law in Vermont is written, it mentions psychosis and it, it says that the head of the cannabis control board is tasked with finding out how much CBD needs to be added to the THC to prevent psychosis. 
Now I haven't seen that covered in, you know, in yeah. the CCB, or I haven't seen them convene a, a, a group of scientists to research this. We're, we're just really impressed with what Colorado has done. Uh, I mean, you're a huge state and your resources are, are, you know, you have, think about how many psychiatrists exist, but they've just done enormous work. So this, the Vermont Medical Society took a lot of, you know, lead from, from them. And this is our warning that we uh, passed back in November, um, psychosis impaired driving addiction, addiction, pure out, a suicide attempt, uncontrolled vomiting, which has been actually fatal occasionally, um, kidney failure and whatnot, dehydration, harm to fetus and nursing babies. And importantly, these events can happen in people who have no previous history of psychosis or mental illness. I think that's really important because there's this profound misperception that anybody who gets who, who develops an addiction or who develops, you know, a psychosis or schizophrenia, quote unquote, from marijuana is, in fact, was going to do it anyway. Yeah, there's a lot. The industry really loves to blame people for addiction and mental health issues. We found that um, you might want to stop screen sharing. Um, we found that um, there's an enormous amount of blame and shame that the industry tries to use to deflect from that the fact that their products are dangerous. They love to say, oh, we've heard um, addiction is a choice. Some kids are just bad kids. Um, this is a parenting problem. And really, again, it's, it's very sad to watch like not only, you know, communities and states, but we are literally reliving what just happened with tobacco, mm -hmm. what just happened with the opiate crisis, we are taking hook, line, and sinker the lies that this industry is, is pushing for profit. And, you know, as states, we've done calls with states and begged them, put money in this bill so that people can afford to save their children. Right. And it is as if, you know, we're crazy and marijuana is the answer to all problems, both physical and financial. And time is just going to have to show these states and as more kids struggle with this issue and you see the devastation that Colorado has been experiencing and you know I feel proud for the most part of the state of Colorado being willing to look now at these issues and 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 you know I notice you have represented Judy Amable up there when we have legislators up that are willing to talk about their own families and the harms that they've experienced and refuse to be shamed and silenced anymore. That's how we're going to fix this issue, but there will be a lot of lives ruined and um, destroyed until that happens. Yeah, that don't need to be. So I think we should listen to her and then we'll listen. I'd like you to listen to um, a synopsis of the, of the, of what's happening in marijuana, it's just a few, in, in Vermont, it's just a few minutes long. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I also would like to speak in support of this bill today. Um, as many of you know, I have a son who started smoking marijuana in the eighth grade and then smoked marijuana consistently and persistently. Um, all through high school. And at age 18, he had his first psychotic break. And we did not know what the cause of that was, but during that time, before that happened, we had tried everything in our power to stop his marijuana use. We sent him to psychiatrists, to, to therapists. We grounded him, we drug tested him, we punished him. We praised him for the things that he did do, but we couldn't stop the use. Everywhere he went, this product was available and in greater and greater uh, concentrations and potency. And uh, after his first psychotic break, we, we sent him to a hospital where he spent six weeks and it cost us $60,000 and they didn't fix it. They couldn't fix it. 
Today, he has schizoaffective disorder with co-occurring substance misuse, and he will never recover, and our family is broken as a result, and we will never be made whole. So let's not talk about him today because it's too late for him. Let's talk instead about your children and the thousands of other children that are being negatively impacted by the use of marijuana. It's a real thing. And let me just say that hundreds of parents, thousands of parents are being affected by this. And we are done being blamed and shamed into silence. We will be silent no more. And this bill gives us a voice. It says, yeah, we have to look at this. This is on us. This is what we were sent here to do. And I urge you to vote yes. Representative Holtorf. Cannabis is going to be sold legally, so it must be pretty harmless, right? That is what those that sell it in your town want you to believe, because when people think a substance is relatively harmless, they use it more. This is generally the case in Vermont, which has the highest past month cannabis or THC use in the United States for both adults and teens. While people have been taught that cannabis is a harmless plant, today's high THC products come in many forms, making cannabis up to 40 times stronger than in the past. Doctors know that Vermonters want to be informed decision makers. The Vermont Medical Society reviewed the latest research. What did they find? Cannabis or THC may cause one, psychosis. There are numerous studies on cannabis, psychosis, and schizophrenia. Using greater than 15% THC products daily may result in five times the likelihood of developing psychosis and increase schizophrenia. In some cities, cannabis accounts for nearly half the new psychotic patients. In Colorado, where recreational cannabis was first legalized, emergency room visits have spiked, crowding hospitals, overburdening healthcare facilities, and increasing costs. Two, impaired driving. One in six Vermont teen drivers say they drove under the influence of marijuana last month. Currently, one in five fatal car crashes in Vermont involve THC. Three, addiction. The number one state in the U.S. for substance use disorder is Colorado. Vermont is currently number two. If cannabis sellers target kids, this increases addiction. In cannabis legal states with laws like Vermont's limiting advertising, ads like this are still found without health warnings. This targeting is especially concerning since current Vermont rules say cannabis drug stores may be located as close as 500 feet from a school and right next to a daycare. Four, suicide attempt. A review of numerous studies concluded that adolescent risk of suicide attempt increased by an average of three and a half times with the use of cannabis, even when there is no history of mental illness. Five, uncontrollable vomiting. A new condition known as cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, or CHS, results in extreme pain and potentially life-threatening, unrelenting, violent vomiting due to cannabis use. Rare prior to cannabis commercialization, CHS is an expensive healthcare burden doctors now see daily in busy ERs. Six, harm to a fetus or a nursing baby. Use of marijuana during pregnancy may stunt the growth of the fetus, and these children may have higher rates of depression, hyperactivity, and inattention. Vermont doctors recommend a cap on THC of 15%, which is about 10 times as potent as marijuana of the 1970s. In Holland, where cannabis use has been prevalent for years, health and government officials propose classifying products above 15% THC as hard drugs, similar to cocaine and ecstasy. The current Vermont legislation allows for plants with THC as high as 30% and concentrates as high as 60%. The higher the THC, the more addictive and the greater the risk of physical or mental health issues, such as psychosis, addiction, suicide, or self-harm. The Vermont Medical Society recommended that these six warnings be added to cannabis and THC product labels and advertisements. Vermonters want to be informed decision makers. So we can we can finish up, Dawn, if we have a few more words. We just want to be sure everybody who feels strongly about this issue will call their house representative or senator. And the number is 
828-2228 because right now there's a bill in Vermont that has a lot of support which lifts the limits that we have, which are 30 and 60% THC to have no limit on the recreational marijuana. Right now we have no limit on medical. So if you have a medical condition, there's no limit, but they want to get rid of the limits that we, Vermont did put in uh, last year when we passed the bill. Um, so if, if you have concerns or if you want the Vermont Medical Society's warnings like they are in Colorado to show up on the packaging, please call as well. Um, because right now the warnings are gonna say it may be habit forming and it will not mention psychosis, suicidality or addiction. It's sad to see Vermont legislators really backing away from science and public health. It will be very sad and um, shameful, honestly, for the Vermont legislature to bow to the demands of a for-profit industry, which is honestly something that, you know, usually we hope that Democrats stand with the people and with the he public health and science. So it's really um, disappointing and it, like I said, shameful to see them being willing to auction off the next generation of Vermont's kids for profit and so that they are well liked and that they get donations from the cannabis industry, both the national and the industry in Vermont. But it's, it's a sad day to see um, if the Vermont legislature really turns their back on science and chooses profit and addiction over youth. It, and that's really what it would come down to. So I hope that doesn't happen in Vermont. And um, and I hope at some point that, you know, I feel like Colorado is the cautionary tale. Don't do what we did here. But in Colorado, we are beginning to try and make right and do right by our next generation and change the tide. So, you know, I hope that these other states don't have to go through the agony that our youth have had to go through and our families have had to go through. Um, and we'll just have to wait and see, but hopefully people will learn from our mistakes here, but um, the, it'll be the, a bad day for Vermont the, if they relieve, remove those caps. The CCB is saying if we don't uh, remove the caps that we're gonna have black market uh, illicit market problem. And of course, in Colorado, the promise was that if you commercialized and legalized it, you would get rid of the illicit market. Do you think the illicit market is disappeared from Colorado? Oh my God. The illicit market is worse than it's ever been. And it's just, it's almost a laughable joke. Literally every tax or regulation that the industry faces they bully people and threaten by saying, oh, this is just gonna make the black market worse and the black market, the black market. Well, you know what? It has made the black market worse, all of these products. The black market is out of control in Colorado and it's just a joke. And every law enforcement agency that we have talked to and met with, and they testified about this at the Capitol said that it is not the case. So it is not, keeping a potency cap is not going to wildly destroy the state of Vermont through a black market. This, the, the high potency products will do enough on their own to destroy youth in Vermont. You don't need the black market to do it. Dawn, I cannot thank you enough. Number one, for being concerned, for bringing your talents to this issue and, and deciding to spend some time with us in Vermont today. It's Thank very you so important much for having me. Sure. Take care.